The Roots of the Peebler Family by John Peebler. Information handed down from both written and by a word of the mouth seemed to point to a strong possibility that the Peeblers came from the county of Peeblers, the original family spelling in Scotland. They were neither Catholic nor Presbyterians and so become nonconformists. This was during the reign of Queen Mary that is known as the Bloody Mary, and since she was a rank Catholic, those were not Catholic, those who were not Catholic were in danger of their lives. On the other hand, the John Knox Presbyterians of, of that day were about as hard-boiled as the Catholics, and the Peebers clan were caught between the two religions. Because of the religion persecution, the, Peeber, the Peebles immigrated to France where they found refuge for a short time. There was a large body of Protestants, known as Hugnuts, in France, and the Peebles probably joined this group. But when devout Catholic Charles the knife took the throne. He ordered thousands of Hugnots to be killed, and the Peebles were forced to flee to Switzerland. While in Switzerland, the Peebles joined the Dunkards, also known as Brethren of German Baptists. They became members shortly after the church was organized, but soon had to flee Switzerland because of religious persecution and to escape military duty. From Switzerland, the Peebles went to Holland, which was one of the only countries left on earth that was free from religious persecution. It was while in Holland that the Peebles changed the spelling of their name. The Dutch people exchanged the S for an R, and that is the way most descendants spell their names today as Peeblers. Along about 1710 or 1720, some of the Peeblers came to America and settled in North Carolina. They lived near Waxhaw, the town where Andrew Jackson was born. By the time the Revolutionary War started, the Peeblers were still living in North Carolina, and some were probably among the scouts of General Martin. Later, where the Kentucky, when the Kentucky Territory opened up, the Peebles, along with the Lincolns, Boones, and the Kendalls, moved into the area. A few of the Peebles who came to America around 1719 probably settled in Germantown, Pennsylvania, where they rejoined a group of Dunkards. From Kentucky and Pennsylvania, the Peebles moved westward into Missouri, Kansas, and Oregon. Some also moved northward to Illinois and Iowa. Many of the Klan members have stayed in the Middle West from where they first arrived around 1810 to 1820 until the present day. Andrew W. Peebler, one of the earliest settlers of Atchison County who lived at Locust Grove from 1855 to 1882. Andrew W. Peebler, who died at the age of 90 at his home, W. M. Peebler, at Meridian, Kansas. He was 90 years old in three months and was totally blind the last years of his life. He went from Locust Grove to Meridian, and after living there six or seven years, moved to Oklahoma and then back to Meridian. He leaves seven living children, Mrs. S. H. Kimball of Atchison, Albert Peebler of Idaho, W. M. and John O. Peebler of Meridian, Samuel S. Peebler of Butler County, Kansas, Mrs. John H. Bear of Kansas City, and Mr. and Mrs. Moser of Oklahoma. The deceased was born in Kentucky and before coming to Ashton lived at Springfield, Illinois and was a neighbor of the Lincoln and Yates family. The funeral was <coughs> Samuel S. Peebler had four children, a son, Fred, a son, Merle, a daughter, Alta, and Cora. My father and mother was Fred and Mary Peebler. My mother, Mary, was born near Aspen, Colorado her dad had remarried, and her, she and her stepmother didn't get along very well, so mother had went to work for di different people. She was started out as a Catholic and later left home, and then later migrated to Kansas, where she met uh, Fred Peebler. Mary worked as a maid for a family here in Kansas. The family decided to move to California, and Mary went with them. Fred, who was already in love with Mary, followed the family to the Sunshine State. There they were married in 1910. Fred and Mary took up a claim in Tucumcari, New Mexico, and lived in a dugout where Orville was born. It was a dugout with a sod roof. Life was very primitive and soon grew tired of, the, of New Mexico. The Peebler family moved to Augusta, Kansas. They had four children, Orville, Sam, Bill, and John, and Beverly. While living in Augusta, from Augusta, they moved to Latham, Kansas, and settled on a farm there. This is where Winifred and Ivel was born on the farm at Latham.
Lathern. This farm was situated four miles north and a mile and a quarter west of Latham. It was the old Peebler farmstead, which uh, contained about 80 acres. About 40 of these was in farmland, and probably the rest was in grass. As long as we lived on the farm, Dad never owned a tractor. He did all his farming with horses and pull-type equipment. This was very hard times for the Peebler family. It was during the Depression and during the drought. There was seven Peebler children and mother and father, and so you can imagine what it must have been like to try to make a living for these folks, keep food on the table and clothes on their, on their bodies. The Peebler children all went to a little country school by the name of Enterprise. It was one through eighth grade, taught by one teacher. Some of the children went on to uh, Latham to high school. Some finished there, some didn't finish. I was six months old when we moved to the farm, so this would have been in the years of uh, about 1922 to 23, and the, my folks probably lived on that farm until the late 30s. Then they moved to Latham, Kansas. We had neither electricity or running water on the farm, so consequently all the water for the household use had to be drawn. We had a little what we call an 80 inch case well with a bucket that you lowered by ropes and pull this up. So needless to say, you was very conservative with water. Our stock was watered with a hand pump. Uh, we had a tank that the boys would take turns pumping water into this tank, and this is how we watered all our livestock. We probably milked three to four cows most of the time. We had probably three to four workhorses and one ride. Mother either did her washing on a, on a washboard or a hand-powered wash machine. If she could get her kids to help her, she would, or otherwise she'd run it herself. So you can imagine about how tired she must have been by the end of the day, and then she would probably sit up in bed doing some of the patching and some of the things to try to get ready for the next day. All of her ironing would have had to have been by flat irons that she heated on the old wood stove in her kitchen. Of course, this is what she used to cook the year round. Uh, it didn't matter whether it was 100 degrees or zero. And a lot of times at night, our house would get below freezing, so you would just, we would sleep three or four in the bed, as it was only a two-room bed, a two-bedroom house, why we had to kind of bunk up together. I can't particularly remember being bored on the farm. We didn't have TV. We read some ranch romance magazines, I assume, and of course what homework we had to do. We did lots of hunting is in the either rabbits for meat on the table or for fur bearing animals that we would skin out, stretch and sell on the market. And this is how the boys uh, got our spending money and helped supplement maybe the income of the family. At Christmas time we all shared in the cost of preparing the foods and the candies and so this was a very special time at our house because it was sweets that we ordinarily didn't get but maybe once a week. Uh, with the rest of the year. I can remember that mother had an aunt uh, that lived in Chicago. Aunt Iva was an entertainer. She was a toe dancer. Her husband, whose name was Uncle Sig, was a commercial artist. He did work for like Sears and Roebuck, Montgomery Ward in their catalogs. And uh, we still have a painting. It's a uh, scene of trees and clouds that uh, was handed down to us from my parents, from Uncle Sig. Uh, they lived on Lake Geneva, Chicago, near Chicago. I can remember one time they decided they would come and visit their farm family, or Mary, uh, and I have a sister on the farm. Well, we were very poor, and uh, there was not really money much to fix up the house, so I can remember that the walls were plastered, and so uh, we did manage to get some whitewash, and we whitewashed the walls, and, and of course, Mom would have, her the house was always clean. It was never any rugs on the floor, except she did some uh, rug hooking and out of old old clothes, and uh, she might have had a few of these scattered rugs around. But anyway, they decided that they would bring their friends from Chicago. I can remember I was just a youngster, but so here they came, uh, Uncle Sig and Aunt Iva, and, uh, uh, and then they had another man who stayed with him. He dabbled in experimental. I remember he was making rubber ties when we he was at our house. But anyway, it must have been quite a shock for Aunt Iva because I don't think she realized 
how primitive we really le uh, lives we really lived out, of, out on the farm and uh, I'm sure they didn't stay too long but after that we started getting our yearly package from Aunt Iva and this was our main Christmas when they come to visit they also had a girl by the name Janice with them well my brothers was old enough to really like the girls and it was Sam and Bill and Orville and I can remember an instance where Sam and Bill decided they would saddle the, the riding horse and take Janice for a ride. So they were out, they got the horse all saddled and up in the yard. And So here come Orville and Janice out, hopped on the horse and took off. And of course, Sam and Bill was pretty mad at Orville. But in later years, he followed Janice to, back to Chicago uh, and he found work up there. He didn't marry her, but uh, she was his girlfriend for quite a while. Orville was, like a lot of the Peeblers, Orville was musically gifted. I can remember uh, going back on the farm that we uh, dad had usually some kind of an old piano around and he liked to play the pianos his brother Merle would play about any kind of a stringed instrument that you could think of uh, in fact I should have got his violin when he died it was uh, given to me and uh, we just never got the thing picked up which I am sorry for today I learned to court on a, on a guitar and there was a another neighbor of ours who played a violin and uh, there was another guy who played a a banjo and so we played for a few dances around the dances they would just move uh, either they'd have it in the hay mow and they'd bed the kids down on the hay and on blankets and and dance in the hay mow or they would go to someone's house and move the furniture out of one room and and uh, that's where they would dance so I got to play a little bit like this my extent of my career probably was just a little bit of cordon on guitar I later took violin in school I didn't do much with it but anyway uh, uh, I had fun trying. I can remember some of the public dances around, and mo most of these was usually in the Hayman hours. There was a few what they called outside platforms where they danced in the summertime, but there'd always be some guy off of the uh, trunk of his car open, and he would be uh, selling spike uh, pop. He would uh, spike it with a, they call it alky, and they'd sell it like for two bits a bottle or something like this. I was too young to really know what was going on, but later in the years I figured that out. About the time that Orville went to Chicago, uh, Sam and Bill, they decided that they were going to seek their fortune and they headed west. They ended up in California, and of course this was still the time when, uh, they, if you remember the show, The Grapes of Wrath, when so many people migrated to California because of their homes in Oklahoma, a lot of their farms had blew, blew away and the dust had, and tumbleweeds had completely blowed over their fences, their buildings, and blew out all their, all their feed and so forth. I can remember the first dust storm I really saw at uh, there at Latham. Uh, it started getting dusk and almost dark and this big cloud coming up in the west. In fact, we were on the way home from the Enterprise and we became very scared. It got dark enough the chickens would go to roost. Well, then for several years, uh, people would wet sheets, put over their windows and uh, because the dust was so severe. I can remember my way back to Sam and Bill. They were, got out to California and they worked in the fruit harvests and I can remember they got down in the Filipino Valley trying to work uh, picking vegetables and so forth but they said they couldn't compete because mostly those were Filipinos and they were short had just bend over most of their life and and so I'm sure they had a very rough time while they were in California later they did come back home on the farm by this time I was about 15 years old and so Orville sent me money to come to Wisconsin by then he had moved up to Wisconsin, was working on dairy farms, and, and he had met uh, a girl by the name of Alice Rosenthal, and uh, so he got me a job on a dairy farm. I worked up there all through the summer into the fall, worked for various dairy farmers, and worked for a, a Pontiac uh, dealership in, in Milwaukee for a while. I would go out with a three-wheeler motorcycle and pick up cars and they had attachment they could attach to the back bumper of the car and I'd drag it in for them to service it and so forth. Uh, while I was on the dairy farms I did buy a, a motorcycle. I remember I paid forty dollars for it. The reason I got it, the guy that had it before me had got killed on it so his wife wanted to get rid of it and so I bought it. And uh, in the fall uh, Orville decided I'd better get back home and try to get back in school so I can remember leaving uh, Milwaukee with five dollars in this motorcycle which doesn't sound like much money now but at the end why it got me home and I got back on the farm and and uh, went back to Latham to high school 
I'm sure I thought more about hunting and fishing than I did of uh, trying to get my studies and so I can remember that uh, uh, we would go out and maybe kill a skunk we would dig him out of his hole and and stretch him out maybe he had sprayed on us and so of course we only had one pair of shoes so we would go to school and the teacher didn't like our smell so she sent us home and so we would go out and, and hunt and fish again so I went through uh, my freshman high school and then I dropped out and uh, this was uh, uh, still during hard times and uh, so I would go out and work for farmers. I can remember one time I was 15 or 16 years old and I decided I was going to wheat harvest and I went as far as Wichita. Of course Wichita is not ne wasn't nearly as big as it is now. Well, I don't remember whether I had the money. If I did, I didn't know how to catch a bus. So I can remember I walked from clear across Wichita and went on out to Goddard. When I got out to Goddard and, and there was uh, a lot of people that followed the harvest. Uh, they looked tough and rough to me, but probably they were just like everybody else. They didn't have a place to bathe or shave, and so they uh, looked pretty tough. So I decided that I didn't like Goddard, and, so, and I can't remember just exactly how I got on down to another town by the name of, of Anthony, Kansas. There I joined up with a man of name his name Curly Wimpin. He ran, at that time there wasn't combines, it was thrash machines and tractors, and so he had a thrashing crew that go across the country. And we would stay at the farmers, they would give us breakfast, and we'd sleep in the hay mow or wherever place. I can remember most farm women would feed you chicken, and I suppose that was a really about the only meat they had and it was probably the cheapest thing so this farm lady would get up early enough to have fried chicken for your breakfast and she'd have chicken and eggs and I suppose and gravy and this sort of thing but uh, uh, I don't remember I suppose I worked for him one Sunday and then I uh, or once one summer excuse me and then I went back home and uh, then this was by this time Sam and Bill had moved on to a little town of Moline Kansas uh, there near Moline was a place they call a uh, Salve Processing Company and they processed well they would process limestone and would, some of it was ground up into lime, some of it was crushed up into rock, some of it was uh, made into riprap that they, so many of the uh, government lakes were built, and built in and they used them to riprap the dams and so forth. Well, <coughs> I went to Moline and I got a job there I can remember they paid us uh, 40 cents an hour and we worked 10 hours a day, four days a week. Uh, this thing was probably a half a mile long, uh, maybe a quarter mile wide and, and 15 to 60, 70 foot deep. And uh, the way they would enlarge it, they would drill holes with a water well around the edges of them. They, they'd have a series of six or eight holes and then they would uh, load them with dynamite and they would blow this off and it would blow it down the hole and then they had electric uh, uh, big shovel and and they would shovel into electric cars there was tracks run around the inside the diameter of this thing and through a crusher building and that's uh, where they would get these in there uh, my job was to haul dynamite up there I when I think back of it now it kind of scares me but we would haul this two inch dynamite and uh, and we drop it in the hole and we tap it down and they had a like they call a, a cap and a cordo and a connector and this was all hooked together in a series and then they had a uh, discharger that they would set it all off and it just looked like a big hand just shoved the whole side of the of this uh, pit off in there and then they would go in of course and, and work these rocks up. The power, the electric power that powered these cars was run off of 3200 volts and there was uh, two tracks, bared tracks in the middle of the, between the outside tracks and we had several people that got killed on those things. Uh, they had to work on them and sometimes they had to work on them when they were alive and Maybe they'd accidentally hit them with a bar and, and uh, it would electrocute them and some of them got into the crusher building and I didn't think it was a very safe place to work. I remember I worked for a while on uh, this riprap. They would hire, they would pay the people by the ton and they had old trucks and they would back up to the sand this rock that had been exposed and you would tumble it on, take bars and pry it till you got rolling and, and you just load it by hand. They didn't have uh, uh, tractors with scoops on them and so and then they would haul it down and back up and they had a ramp that uh, extended out over the boxcars and they would dump this into these boxcars and but by then it was uh, about 39 and uh, 1939 and the war was brewing you know and so I left there and went to Wichita and 
went to aircraft woodworking school. I went there at night. I can remember it was north of uh, a Douglas on Water Street, the school was. So I'd go there at night, and I stayed with my sister Beverly down south St. Francis, and I had uh, got a job with a carpenter. He was building houses uh, south in the south end of town, which was Pawnee at that time. That's far south we went. I'd walk down there and work for this carpenter. I can remember very well because he did, never did pay us. He ran off of their money, and uh, this was money that I really was kind of counting on to help my sister with, with my board and room. But I did get through woodworking, aircraft woodworking, and then I went to work for uh, uh, Cessna aircraft, and I went to work for him in the wing department. We built wings for the uh, the trainer plane. They called it the uh, twin engine Bobcat. It was a trainer plane that they used uh, before they would teach people to fly in this, and then from there they would go into the P-38s and some of the other ones. So it was strictly a training plane. I was still unmarried at the time, and and then the Cessna built a, a factory up at Hutchison, Kansas, to build glider. They had uh, I got a glider contract, and so they asked some of us to go up there, and there was 18 of us went up and started the, the factory up at Hutchison building these gliders, which their contract didn't really last that long. Uh, they later sold it to a box company out of California. Uh, this is where I met uh, Eleanor P. Brewer. At that time, she was a beauty shop, and uh, I guess it was kind of a blind date with her, and, and uh, I was kind of interested in a girl in, in Wichita at the time, and uh, uh, we said it was just temporary, and it was fine with her, but later uh, things changed. We did get married, and and uh, and we lived uh, in a little house. Roy Goff was her boss when she was a beauty operator, and he had a little house in the back of his house, and so this was our first home. Uh, I can remember, and then uh, I worked for this after Cessna sold out while well, I moved to the aircraft woodwork and worked there. We were building, the, I think I was on the door frames for the gliders there. <coughs> and uh, I worked there until I got drafted in the Army. And uh, I can remember that David was born while we lived there. And he was uh, seven days old. I can still remember leaving at night, walking down to the train depot. And that's where everybody went to haul me off to Leavenworth, Elmer's mother. Jean came and stayed with her. At that time, you stayed in bed several times after birth of, several days after birth of baby, and so, and then after she was well enough, uh, she moved home to Claflin with her parents, and she, uh, well, I, all the time I was in service, why, then she ran a beauty shop part of the time in Claflin in their home. I went uh, to Amarillo, Texas for basic training, and I went in as they call it voluntary flight training. Uh, I was uh, worked out on the cat of my eyesight, and they wanted to make a gunner out of me, but I stretched up tall enough, and I think six foot one was the maximum, and I made it up to six foot one and a half. So I went on to aircraft maintenance school. Some of the other guys went on to gunnery school and was shipped overseas. So I went on to Lincoln, Nebraska, went through school at Lincoln, Nebraska, the, what we call A&M school, which is aircraft mechanics, after I finished there, they shipped us out to Lockheed, California, and I went through a specialist uh, school there on P-38, uh, Lockheed uh, P-38s. And this was the uh, first time I'd been to California. It was quite a, quite a shock to me to see the palm trees and everything. And, and we were very near Hollywood, and so we got to go down to Hollywood and, and see the Hollywood Theater and many things like this. Well, after I graduated there, they sent me to San Maria, California, which was a training uh, base for P-38 pilots, and uh, so this is where I stayed. I remember I went to a night school uh, to learn welding while I was at, at uh, San Maria. Uh, San Maria. I worked in the building, they call it PLM. It was, uh, we pulled uh, like 100 hour inspection. I specialized in uh, uh, propellers, so I worked in the prop shop, and which we didn't have very many to work on, and so we would just kind of snooze at night, and the, uh, our squadron was very small, and so the next morning we'd pack our lunch and climb over the fence and, and work in the oil field, and they didn't, of course, there was a shortage of, of labor, and so uh, they would hire us by the day uh, to work. I worked as a roustabout and, and did various things, I suppose digging and all that sort of thing, but uh, uh, so my uh, service career was very uneventful. 
when I got out of the service, I came back and, and uh, Eleanor and I moved to Great Bend, Kansas. We lived in a housing project. It was a housing project for the Great Bend uh, B-29 airfield. Uh, we lived there, oh, I don't know, maybe a year. I don't know. Uh, I can remember they still had uh, uh, the cook stove was coal burning and the, for the hot water, there was a reservoir in the back of the stove that uh, heated your water for your showers. So most of the time in the summertime, you take cold showers. Uh, uh, this is where Bob Peebler was born, our son. Uh, Elmer still reminds me that the day that, uh, that Bob was born, that we had a bad sto uh, storm, and uh, I had a big garden and tore up my tomatoes and said I've spent more time of worrying about my tomatoes than about her state of health and, and Bob's. But Bob was uh, born at Great Bend, Kansas. Uh, later then, when uh, I did go to work for city service, while we moved to a little town of Alden, we lived there for a few years. I think uh, David maybe was a fifth grade, <clears throat> but then I was looking, trying to figure out to get a house for own, and so uh, oil companies at that time had a lot of lease houses, and they were being abandoned, and so I bought a lease house, and uh, we moved that to Chase, Kansas. I can remember my friends happened and we run all the concrete for the foundations at night and uh, I can remember the running the foundation for the the kitchen that we added on and uh, it was kind of snowing and uh, but we'd work every night till 11 o'clock or so and then before it really was finished why well, we moved in in fact we didn't even have water when we moved in and it was very hard on Eleanor and the family and the, uh, but somehow we survived and with the Eleanor's help and David's help and a little help from Bob, and uh, we managed to get his house put together, and we built a family room on it, and and uh, there we li lived while the kids went through high school, and David went on to uh, Emporia College, and uh, later Bob went on to uh, KU College, and David graduated as a biologist major, and uh, Bob gra finally graduated from KU as an electrical engineer. David, of course, married Claudia, and Bob married Pat. And so David and, and Claudia, their first job was in Colorado. David is a teacher, in, I believe, in a junior high, and they taught out there for a while. And then they moved, moved back to Cottonwood Falls. David wanted to do some coaching, and so I think he was uh, taught biology and, and coached in the Cottonwood Falls area. Uh, Bob went on, and uh, he and Patty, uh, with Patty working, and, and like Claudia working, and uh, got him through school, and then he went to work for Summer Jay. Came, came back when we lived in Chase. Eleanor did have a small beauty shop, uh, what was our utility room. We kind of converted into a beauty shop, so Eleanor ran a beauty shop there for a while. Later, she went to work in a grocery store and worked as a grocery store uh, clerk, and then uh, she went to work as the city clerk for Chase, as a, the city clerk, and worked there and until she got a job as uh, secretary to the superintendent in Chase when they went into unification by a man by the name of Keith Adams and then that's where she worked until we later that I bid on a job and and we moved to Russell but then of course the boys were gone and uh, so for a while she was doing two jobs she would work a few days at Russell as a as a secretary to the city manager in Russell and then come back and, and finish stuff her job with Keith Adams as secretary to the Unified School District Superintendent. Uh, I worked uh, in Russell as uh, a field mechanic uh, in the oil fields, of course, and taking care of any kind of maintenance that uh, they might send us on. We overhauled engines and pumps and, and did general maintenance in the oil fields. Eleanor always said that she wouldn't be working when she's 60, so she did uh, quit before her 60th birthday. Uh, we had a, some change in personnel in the garage at Russell, and so uh, later I became a foreman there and worked there for about two years. And at the age of 60, they offered me retirement, and so we retired, and uh, uh, we had bought a lot in Bella Vista, and so we decided that that's where we wanted to make our home, so we moved to Bella Vista. We had, uh, had a mini home, and we lived in it, from May till November where our house was being built and then we moved into our house uh, in Bella Vista.